All right, we've got people showing up. This is great. Uh, we're going to give folks a couple of minutes here. I could see the uh, the audience is growing. Welcome, everyone. Good night to be in. Indeed, indeed. You're right about that. Yeah, we're going to have some work in the morning. A lot of shoveling. All right, we're up to 35. Folks, we're just going to wait. I'm going to wait about one more minute and uh, let people have a chance to, to come in. And then we're going to start. Okay. Let's see here. All right. So um, I'm hoping everyone can see me and hear me. If you can't, um, throw up a, uh, a chat note so I know, but uh, looks like we're all good here. All right, well, thank you all for attending. My name's John McConum with the Merrimack River Watershed Council, and uh, I'm so pleased to, to introduce to you Craig Gibson, and uh, we're going to be talking about crows tonight in the Merrimack River and this incredible <laughs> phenomenon that we have that goes on. Um, I want to give you a little bit of uh, info first about um, a, an event that's coming up for a Merrimack River Watershed Council, uh, our next event that you might want to uh, attend. We're going to have our 2021 virtual annual meeting, and that's going to be on February 25th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, you can sign up through our website or uh, through Facebook, and uh, we're going to give a presentation on what's going on with the Merrimack in the past year. and what we've been up to, and then we're going to follow it up at the end with a viewing of Jerry Monkman's excellent film on the Merrimack called Merrimack, A River at Risk. It's a real interesting um, uh, documentary that was done locally. So uh, let's talk about crows. So I want to tell you a little bit about my first encounter with crows. I was driving down home, heading home on uh, 495. Uh, this is a number of years ago, and I look up, you know, I'm in all the traffic, and there's looks like a conveyor belt of crows going over my head. Of course, everybody who's driving is looking up at them, and it's quite it's quite a scene. It's amazing nobody collided, but this happens every night in the winter. It's just just incredible, and I never knew anything about why it happened, but Craig does, and so Craig is going to tell us all about it. So let me tell you a little bit about Craig. Craig has. Uh, done really a great service for all of us. He has invested a lot of time and energy into finding out why the crows are showing up here and these numbers, these incredible numbers. He started a web page called uh, wintercrowroost.com. So check that out and uh, see all the great information he's posted up there. Uh, Craig's very well known as a uh, bird conservation photographer in the area. And that's where his uh, interest began in this. Um, He's, uh, he's done a great job of expanding people's awareness of, of this crow roost, and he's done it through uh, all sorts of different ways. He's got a, a great educational program he does. He's involved arts groups in it. So there's been, uh, when we've been allowed to you know, be out in, in public, there's been some great art shows on it uh, and gotten the community involved in a variety of different ways, in particular kids. Um, he's written a 14-page report that's very interesting, recapping the uh, 2018 and 19 season, and that's on his website if you want to check that out. Um, anytime there's a story about crows, Craig is always the first person that's quoted, so uh, he is the font of knowledge uh, if you pull up any stories or watch any uh, newscasts about it. Um, and his goal is really to raise awareness of this roost and uh, use it as a catalyst to, um, to, to get more community-based science initiatives going. Um, that, that are going to study this phenomenon. So without further ado, Craig, I'd like to turn it over to you. That sounds great, John. Let's, um, let's see, share. We did this before and it seemed to work. How does that look? Looks Can great. Okay, good, good. Welcome everybody. Delighted to be with uh, all of you here tonight. And uh, thank you, John, for the very warm welcome. It's been a real pleasure the last couple of years um, working with friends at the Merrimack River Watershed Council who have been uh, just so uh, hospitable and engaging. And it's really been 
uh, enjoyable to be able to do this, uh, this work together. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a full-time hospital chaplain at Lawrence General Hospital. And with that, it brings me in and out of Lawrence um, during the week. I'm on Monday through Thursday, and I come up sometimes on weekends. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity to regularly observe the activities around this amazing winter crow roost. Uh, married, three children, three grandchildren, and uh, came into all of this by way of being a really active and, and uh, avid bird photographer. And the crows just kind of took me by storm and, and I haven't looked back. The online presence that John mentioned is, a, is actually a blog and so it's very regularly updated. And then there are stories and links and other resources. So wintercrowroost.com. Uh, uh, I think, John, you, you have the, uh, is everybody going to answer this poll question? Looks oh. like we've got a pretty good uh, number okay. of people, 48 people out of about 60 odd who are here. Okay, so I tried to answer the poll, but it said that I couldn't. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about this winter crow roost, and we're really going to be focused in on, on elements of the crow roost. We have so much that we can cover, but we have limited time, and I'll keep an eye uh, on the clock. So welcome again, and the talk tonight is about the winter crow roost uh, in, uh, in Lawrence, Mass. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, there we go. So I thought it might be nice first to start with this nice photo. Uh, this was an outing. Some of you may have participated with us. Uh, John is in the uh, on the right side with the red Red Sox hat. And uh, this was an outing that was organized by the council uh, early last February. And we're right down against the shoreline of the Merrimack River uh, on the east side of the Route 495 bridge. And uh, shortly after the photo was taken, the crows came in like they were just right on time. It was really, it was really a wonderful time. So a nice uh, photo to remember that outing. Um, this is a photo from that location looking out more to the, the northwest uh, after the sun had uh, started to set the pastel colors in the sky. A very typical flight swirl by the crows before they uh, enter into the roost. Uh, one of many favorite uh, photos. Um, going back a bit, this is a bit more of an iconic photo um, when the crows are roosting by the New Balance uh, factory uh, along the Merrimack by the Duck Bridge. Uh, this was a photo taken one afternoon, probably November uh, before day, just before daylight savings time. And they had come from the uh, McGovern parking garage area. They were coming by the west side of the New Balance factory, uh, and then they were going to circle around into the roost, uh, a favorite photo and beautiful colors of the, uh, the brick New Balance building. Okay, American Crows, very smart, very social, very family centered, very smart, very social, very family centered. When we're working with, with uh, younger students, particularly at the Boys and Girls Club, they really, they identified with this. They said, we're very smart, we're very social, and uh, they also see themselves as family centered. And that allows them to feel a sense of connection with the crows. They have been roosting in these winter roost gatherings for centuries. They used to roost in urban areas, but they're now mostly in cities. And it's not exactly clear why that is. We'll cover that. Roosts can be found in cities from coast to coast uh, and up in Canada as well. A photo I thought might be enjoyable, a crow coming in for a landing late afternoon, great up light up and under the wings, uh, allowing a sense for the viewer to, to capture a moment as the crow is coming in with the wings fully spread. And um, you may not like black birds, but you certainly can look at this and say there's some there's some beauty and grace uh, in this particular captured uh, captured moment. So the American crow, very familiar coast to coast, familiar to bird watchers, familiar to non bird watchers, a large, intelligent, all black bird. Uh, you've heard the calls before, no doubt. Uh, very common sight in treetops, fields, roadsides, and uh, they are opportunistic in, in what they eat. Uh, this will just give you a sense of the range of the American crow in North America, uh, kind of everywhere in the United States other than in the, uh, the Southwest. And you see a, a heavy, that 
lighter brown color, heavy breeding uh, territory in southern Canada. Um, the fish crow, which is another species that we do find in the roost, one of two crows along this eastern part of the United States, almost identical to the American crow, but about a third uh, um, less in size and, and very difficult to identify. Typically, the best way to identify a fish crow is from its, its nasal sounding call, but it is very tough by the most talented bird watchers and, and crow experts, very tough to distinguish between a, a fish crow and an American crow. And very often fish crows will be on near and around uh, any kind of uh, waterways and, and body, uh, bodies of water. And here's just a quick map to take a look at the range of the fish crow where you'll see it's largely in the Southeast. And then over time it has worked its way up North and along the coast towards the northeast. I'm arranging now to go visit a fish crow roost, hopefully next week on an island in a large lake in central Florida, where there have been 10 to 15,000 fish crows reportedly going into a roost every night, uh, much more uh, common down in, in that neck of the woods. I thought it might be interesting for everybody tonight just to see this is an article from 19, uh, 2015, uh, National Audubon raising the question, where do those crows go at night? And in this piece, what they uh, uh, touch on is that the crows stream in by overhead in late afternoon. Uh, probably all of you are somewhat local Merrimack Valley area. You probably have seen the crows um, streaming in. They head to their uh, overnight roost uh, regarded or mentioned in this Audubon article as a giant avian slumber party. And the roost likely provides uh, some element of warm, warmth, protection from predators, perhaps knowledge uh, that they share about food sources and even the possibility in these large overnight roosts that they might function as some type of a dating bar. Uh, all of these are possibilities, but none of them are certain or known uh, for sure. Further in the Audubon piece, question comes up, how many crows in a roost? And whether it's Lawrence or elsewhere, it's pure guesstimate. Very, very difficult to count such large numbers of birds uh, at dusk, declining light conditions. Um, there is a location out in Danville, Illinois, where they have had regular counts of over 100,000, uh, but I think this year they might have counted less than 20,000. So they do, those numbers go up year to year. Uh, the folks in Danville are probably not happy to have such large numbers because they can be a total mess particularly if they're uh, in a downtown area. And then the noise that they make, and some of you may hear that noise, they wake up about 90 minutes before sunrise and they become very loud and vocal before they all take off for, uh, for the day. So winter crow, crow roosts, crows have gathered in roosts um, for centuries. Um, in the US, the first written reports go back to the 1790s. And over the last decades and centuries, roost sizes have been in the hundreds to the thousands to the millions. Um, in Lawrence, <clears throat> the official count for the winter crow roost during the Christmas bird count has been about 15,000 for the last two years. And we're working on ways to better authenticate uh, that count number. And that's gonna take some further work. I can get into that later. Um, in the uh, National Audubon Christmas bird count, it's typically late December, early January. In cities where they did counts of crows as part of that 2020 Christmas bird count in late December, um, in Quebec, there was one location where they posted a count of 72,000, uh, two locations in Ontario, one 57,000, another one 35,000, a location in Iowa where they had 35,000, and then the next highest was Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I've had the pleasure of going to visit that roost and uh, what an amazing uh, show I went down to. For those who might notice, I've got on a Villanova top. Our daughter who is 22 graduated last year. She's a nurse uh, in Boston. And so I went down one weekend with the intent of driving to Lancaster about an hour from Villanova, Pennsylvania. 
And if you can pause for a minute, for those of you who are old enough to have grown children approaching in or out of college, our daughter had five guy friends who signed up to come with me, an hour drive from Villanova to Lancaster. We got there, we hit the jackpot on the crows. We were there for about an hour and an hour drive back. And then I treated them all for dinner. I was blown away that five college guys would be willing to take a trip on the hope of maybe, maybe being able to see some crows. And we saw thousands and thousands. So that was a real good story in Lancaster. Um, John James Audubon, a name known to probably all of you at some level or another, was fascinated by winter crow roosts. Uh, he did some writing about it, and here, uh, the quote, in the late fall, they retire in immense numbers to roost by ponds, lakes, and rivers. They may be seen proceeding to such places more than an hour before sunset in long, straggling lines. Audubon was good to take notice. Further, he went on to say, before dawn, the crowns of the crows sound a reveille, engage in a general thanksgiving for the peaceful repose they have enjoyed, a very thoughtful reference, and then parties in succession fly off to pursue daytime foraging and relieve the weeds that he had seen them roosting in from the weight that bent them down. It's interesting, we've done some time-lapse photo sequences and when the crows all land in the trees, frequently along the Merrimack River, these are silver maple and river birch trees. If, if the branches and the tops of the trees without leaves are like this, you, 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 along the side of the tree, from the time lapse, you see the branches slowly go like that, not because of the heavy weight, but the incremental weight of each bunch of crows. And then in the morning when they take off in the time lapse photo, you slowly see these branches come back up to where they were standing before. Fascinating stuff. Um, locally, uh, a, phys a physician by the name of Charles Wendell Townsend, who was born in Boston in 1859, must have moved up to I Ipswich, um, Harvard undergraduate and Harvard Medical School. He was uh, an avid birder. He was a member of the Essex County Ornithological Club and uh, a number of other clubs and was a director for Mass Audubon. He was fascinated and wrote about uh, the winter crow roost that he observed in, in um, Ipswich. He wrote about it, it was published, and he presented it at a gathering or a meeting of the club. He presented his paper in December of uh, 1917. It was published in one of the most influential uh, journals of biology over the last hundred years. So um, very interesting. And here's what he said, just a few excerpts that for him, it was intensely interesting experience, intensely interesting experience, observing the crows returning to what he calls the night lodgings. And that as an observer out in the field, he said, one wished for eyes all about the head. For those of you who have, who have been out, and for those of you who may hopefully go out inspired by tonight's uh, get together, that, that when the crows come in, you, absolutely wish that you have eyes in the back of your head because at some times there can be so much going on, you simply can't take it all in. He speaks further about being well sharpened with wits to interpret, probably needing a trained assistant to take notes. And the big question that he points to is how many? And it's such a difficult question to be able to answer. So this is, I uh, just want to make sure I didn't skip. This is a view, I'm going to intersperse some photos throughout just to be able to give you uh, some visuals as we, uh, as we go through the PowerPoint. This is a photo taken in December, probably an hour, hour 15 minutes after sunset time. The New Balance building is in the background. These are the silver maple and river birch trees along the banks of the Merrimack that you see there. And a photo from the bridge looking west, southwest. And you can see how evenly the crows are dispersed in the, in the relatively tops and sides of the trees going all the way down. Um, I don't think it was too windy that night, but it just gives you a sense of what that roost looks like after dark. I've been doing a lot of work with long exposure photography. So a photo like this, there is no flash. There's nothing to disrupt the, 
the crows, it's all manual settings for exposure and it's manual settings for focus as well. And once you have those settings down, it provides an opportunity to be able to get these uh, uh, pictures that help us get a better view of what goes on after dark. Here's another photo, same approach of the crows in these uh, trees along the side of the river on the north side of the New Balance building. And again, it gives you an opportunity to be able to sense how are they dispersed? How tight and close are they together? I didn't have time to include some recent drone overhead photos, but it's remarkable from a drone overhead photo to be able to see the spacing in between the crows. You can't get that sense from this lateral view, but from an overhead drone photo, which we're working on utilizing more and more, it helps us to better understand how they achieve uh, uh, spacing uh, in between each other. So they're not shoulder to shoulder or side, uh, side by side. This is another photo taken from a park located to the next to the Mill 240 apartment complex on the north side of the river, right at the edge of the river. And the camera view is I'm looking south, southwest a little bit uh, at the trees behind a truck depot that is just to the west of the New Balance uh, factory. And again, you can see with this long exposure, you can see how the crows are, um, you know, how they are uh, packed in with the trees there along the edge of the river. And then this is another photo, a bit like the first one, but just zoomed in a bit and a bit farther down along the edge of the New Balance building and then behind the National Grid substation that is next to New Balance in the trees there. And if you look closely against the, the background of the brick uh, storage building, uh, you can see crows in the trees there and then they're also off to the left as well. This is a photo taken about an hour and a half after sunset time uh, from about the same location um, uh, as the photo that we started off with, just east of the Route 495 bridge on the south shore, uh, the Merrimack River gently flowing by. That's the 495 northbound that we see in the background and the trees along the north side of the river uh, with enough ambient lighting and, and long exposure. Again, you can see how they're, the crows are spaced out, settled in for the night, very loud before this, and then they settle down and everything goes pretty much all quiet. I had mentioned to John that I had included uh, what I thought is just a very special um, photo of the Merrimack River looking from that same location a minute ago, the slide before, but looking up towards Riverwalk, you can see the clock tower in the background, the still water of the Merrimack, still some lingering sky color and just a beautiful scene and uh, a reminder that there is great natural beauty uh, along the Merrimack River in so many locations uh, and even along the Merrimack in the city of Lawrence. Um, so there are many theories on why uh, crows gather like this in large roosts. Again, predator avoidance, urban heat islands perhaps, they tend to always gather around areas with substantial ambient background lighting and it also may serve as an information center overnight on where food supply might be available during the daytime. Uh, I love this photo. It shows the crows on utility wires um, in the National Grid substation. And these crows will eventually fly around the corner into the overnight roost. These large communal roosts are, um, are found in urban areas literally from coast to coast. And they used to be in more rural areas. And then in the 70s, they found a, a far greater uh, movement into uh, downtown and urban areas. The, ro the roosts are made up of two species of bird, both the American crow and the fish crow. But for the most part, most of these overnight communal roosts, uh, the primary uh, birds in these roosts are the American crow. Here is a photo of the crows taking off uh, along Merrimack Street facing west with a sunset sky. They had been staging on top of the roof of the building to the left. It's actually uh, two long buildings, about three football fields long. And at about 25 minutes after sunset time, it's almost like there's a, a silent whistle that is blown and they take off in large numbers 
and they go across uh, towards the Merrimack River and then into the Roost. So after the breeding season, much farther north from where we are, some 100, 500, 600 miles northeast of where we are, after the breeding season, the crows depart the breeding grounds and they migrate south. They relocate to urban areas and they form large roosts. They tend to go back to the same area year after year, and they tend to remain in the roost for the most part during the course of the full winter season. Um, and, and there are occasions where there have been satellite uh, tracked crows who have made a movement to other roost locations. Um, more research is needed uh, on that. So gradually over October, November, December, the roost gets larger as more local crows and migrants come in and join the nightly roost. They likely uh, hit maximum size in the roost right around now or a little bit later, you know, say around Valentine's Day, sometimes it's easier to remember dates around holiday holidays. So they probably max out on or near um, maybe between Groundhog Day and Valentine's Day. And then the numbers start to decline into March and then a breakup uh, in March and into April. And the same cycle repeats itself year in and year out. Here's a magnificent shot well after sunset time with some lingering twilight color in the sky. The crows came around from a roof around the corner. We're looking west-southwest. The building on the left is the west edge of the New Balance building. And you see this magnificent swirling flight action as they begin to come into the roost. Crows are, as mentioned before, very social, very smart. The social activity tends to pick up substantially during the roosting season as they tend to be much more quiet and on their own during the breeding season. There is a great deal of loud vocalizations that go on as they enter into the roost and then in the morning as they prepare to, uh, to depart the roost. The crows are known for their intelligence and also wariness to humans. They are also very family centered as mentioned before. Here's another huge flight stream before they go into the roost. The crow roost is made up of both local resident crows and migrants that may come from as much as 500 miles away. The resident crows are here year round and oftentimes they will go out during the daytime to their home territory. The migrant crows arrive, they follow da daily patterns out to foraging grounds, and then they depart later in the winter to go back to breeding grounds. Here's another dazzling photo of the crows coming into the roost. In this case, it was after dark, it was later in the winter season. Uh, you just see the incredible concentration and the, the, the noise that goes with it. Uh, a similar scene with the Route 495 bridge in the background there. And, um, so the roost may change locations uh, during the winter months. Um, oftentimes those changes are made for weather and wind protection. Last year, it looked like they migrated east and down the Merrimack River, and then they found this spot in trees on the north side of the Merrimack, just on the east side of the Route 495 bridge. And if you're ever out there or going by, you'll see that it gives them very good protection from the very regular northwest winds during this time of year. And on nights like this, it can get pretty cool, especially with the wind chill. The shifts may be gradual or they may be sudden, but typically the overnight roost location will remain within a mile at most two from where they start off uh, the season at the New Balance building. We try to do a very good job of uh, tracking those changes uh, and they are noted in the blog and, and um, uh, even more, more up-to-date from uh, Instagram as well. Um, at first light, typically about 90 minutes before sunrise, they, they tend to awaken. You hear a murmuring that turns into a louder set of vocalizations. And then um, 60 minutes to 90 minutes before sunrise, they start to move out in groups. And by sunrise, by the first moment of sunrise light, the last crows have already departed for the day and they've done a bit of a direct flight out to foraging grounds. They fly out in all directions from the roost and then based on research, they tend to get into flight lanes uh, a, a mile or two out 
and they follow those flight lanes out to foraging grounds and they tend to follow the same flight lanes uh, uh, day in and day out and they go right out to those foraging grounds. This is a photo taken last winter with a truck going over the bridge. Uh, you can only imagine what the truck driver might have thought looking off to his right northbound as he's traveling northbound at this amazing swarm of uh, uh, dark birds going by. Um, when they go out to foraging grounds during the daytime, the distance may be up to 50 miles. Uh, the average distance based on research that had been done previously would suggest about 20 miles. Uh, direct flight to get there about 40 minutes plus or minus at most. Uh, again, they follow the same flight paths. Something just happened to my camera. Hmm. We can still see your screen. We can still see your Yeah, I have a, an attached, uh, I'm glad John's there. Uh, okay, can you, can you see me now? John? No, we can see your name. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. That tells me to, uh, hang on. Let me, Bear with me one second. Oh, that's not it. Okay. How about now? Yeah, back. we can see you. Okay. You're back. Okay, hold on. And we'll, we're, we're all learning the technology, right? For sure. Yeah. So uh, bear with me, friends. Oop. Okay. So uh, they say they take the same flight paths on most days and they usually retain, uh, return uh, to the same foraging grounds each, uh, each day. The flight time in the afternoon tends to be much longer. They kind of skip and hop and take their time coming back in. Typically they will begin the return to the overnight roost maybe two or three hours before sunset. They'll, they'll make that return flight in smaller groups and those smaller groups will become larger and larger and they will make some layover stops in staging areas. They tend to fly along the same lines coming back in and again, many stops along the way and they may meet up in these pre-roosting aggregations. We uh, frequently try to get out and, and, and scout around for those. Uh, if any of you encounter some of those that are two, three, four miles away, please uh, uh, be in contact with John. I'd love to know and uh, get out and document some of that. Here's some streaming. This is on the east side of the Duck Bridge, looking back at the Marston Medical Building alongside the river near the Route 495 bridge. And this is a shot of some of the crows coming back in towards the roost, which would be behind me. Uh, this is a, a, a one of many favorite uh, photos the crows here are staging on the rooftop of a company called b and Advanced Warehousing. They actually have two sets of roofs um, the size of three plus football fields. And the crows can all land here after sunset and stay until 30 or so minutes after sunset time. And then they lift off in a very orderly fashion and head over to the roost uh, around the corner. This view is from the fifth floor open air of the McGovern Regional Transportation Building where the train station is. So if you go up to the very top of the roof, you can have this kind of view. They're not there now, they were there earlier in the season. So these pre-roost sites range from uh, a one-tenth of a mile to over, you know, maybe a, a mile and a half from each other. And they're typically less than a mile away from the overnight roost. As they get closer to the final roost, these staging groups, as you just saw in the rooftop photo, get larger and larger. So that rooftop photo that you just saw might have been five or 6,000 crows, five or 6,000 crows filling out um, all of the distant roof and two thirds of the sections of the, the roof in the foreground. Yikes. Um, and uh, individuals that are arriving in groups may settle into these staging areas independent of the crows that they arrived with. <laughs> I always uh, uh, get a chuckle when I see this. This is, you know, one of many areas they'll, they'll 
pick a spot, they'll pick a, a line of fence, they'll utility wires. This is a, a truck used as a convenient spot. And notice the spacing, somewhat equidistant between each of the, uh, each of the crows. Uh, what you can't see is there were many larger numbers on the ground uh, below the truck. This is at the south end of the Casey Bridge over the Merrimack River, uh, just on the west side. It was kind of a, a construction, uh, uh, an area for uh, construction equipment. Uh, another beautiful uh, photo with stunning background sky colors of the crows coming back into the roost. There was recent research done by Professor Andrea Townsend at Hamilton College. She published a study that she did looking at two roosting crow locations in up, upstate New York and uh, out in California. And what she was looking at and trying to study is this notion of partial migration. Fish crows are not known to migrate. They tend to stay local. American crows are known to be migrants, but, but they really are partial migrants where some will, will migrate every year, others will migrate sometimes, and, and further others after that won't migrate at all. So she was looking at this notion of partial migration. This is a copy of the paper that was published, where do crows go and how do they characterize partial migration? Um, so some do, some don't, and that's common among many different species of birds, but little is known about how it works. So her study was to look at um, migration patterns and what might contribute to the flexibility around environmental conditions. So she captured crows in two locations, Utica, New York and Davis, California. She had been on the faculty out at Davis and then had moved up to Hamilton, allowing her to do this study in two different locations. She put on satellite transmitters to track the movements. And then she also collected blood, blood samples. So typically from a captured crow, um, and I know this from uh, trapping uh, or being out with people trapping uh, peregrine falcons. They take the blood sample from one of the uh, one of the arteries under the wing, and then they also collect feather samples as well. And what they found from their study is that the crows migrated an average of 310 miles, but had a total range of somewhere between uh, over. Uh, in, over 173 to maybe almost 700 miles. And the same recro uh, crows returned to the same breeding uh, locations from her study year to year. And crows that migrated one year typically migrated the next year as well. The crows that stayed put remained homebodies year after year. Very interesting. 80% um, of the crows in the roost locations where she did her study, 80% were migrants who came from significantly farther away breeding ground territories, and about 20% were local residents. The locals tended to stay within a 15 mile radius, and again, most of them were American crows. The migrants up to from 100 to 600 miles away, fascinating. And we can apply much of that uh, to Lawrence. I've had a wonderful chance to visit many other crow roosts, uh, including Lancaster, Pennsylvania that I had mentioned to you earlier, uh, Springfield, Mass last year, Auburn, New York last year, Hartford, Connecticut this year, and more recently, Troy, New York and Poughkeepsie, New York. And the more of these roosts that I visit, the more I can, can know and understand and see the similarities and ask questions about some of the, the differences. Um, here's a beautiful photo from Riverfront State Park, the crows streaming back in towards the roost, uh, dust but not quite dark. Here's the 495, Route 495 bridge in the background, similar activity. And uh, this was from the south side of the Merrimack River last year with the crows coming into the trees right next to uh, uh, the Route 495 bridge. You can see in that lower left-hand corner, the Lawrence uh, Water Tower. Um, so the Lawrence roost is, we've been able to study it very intensely over the last four winters. We had three of us that got started and many others have joined the fun. Uh, we've had uh, individually, we've had 300 plus uh, observation nights after the last four winters. 
we probably have had close to or over 300 people come out in groups and smaller gatherings. Uh, regular postings on mass bird for those of you who are regular birders. Um, there's an online portal uh, also that we have been using eBird where we make uh, very regular um, postings there. And then also uh, in the blog postings at wintercrowroost.com, regular postings there with photos and an explanation of uh, and updates on, on where the crows are and what they're doing. Um, we had all gone out to a, a COVID school, a uh, two and a half day crow school out in um, outside of Seattle, Washington, and had a chance to get to meet and know a number of crow experts that we're still in touch with. We've expanded that circle of crow experts and they've been very helpful in, in uh, providing us with, with uh, uh, sharing their knowledge and wisdom about crows and crow behavior. Um, the blog has become very popular. The readership continues to grow. Again, sightings and photos. Uh, we also put up research and research papers, uh, as well as national crow news and uh, some critical links as well. So as we close or prepare to close out, uh, looking over the last four years, the roost started at New Balance in the winter of 2017-18. It then moved up like it did this year to the Great Stone Dam. Uh, from there, it then moves kind of in a counterclockwise way into Methuen, down along Route 93, and then back into International Way and the Bashara Boathouse before going back to New Balance at the end of March. In 2018-2019, again, the roost got started at the New Balance location, moved again up to the Great Stone Dam, many nights around the Bashara Boathouse, which is a little farther upriver, and then uh, International Way, and around that area and up by the cemetery complex, St. Mary's and Immaculate Conception. They liked that area quite a bit and we took a lot of photos up there and had sightings. Then uh, a year ago, they started out at New Balance. That tends to be the spot they get started every year. Then they moved east along the Merrimack River around the Prospect Hill area and they settled in in kind of a substantial secondary roost location for the balance of the winter on the east side of the Route 495 bridge at the north end. And uh, with that, we uh, observed massive staging of crows before going into the roost around the airport. And then they would move down uh, to the edge of the river uh, by Charles Street and uh, the water treatment plant, and then up along the north side of the river in the incinerator road area before going into the final roost. Fascinating. Just really is amazing. And then this year they started at New Balance. They started to go up and back a little bit to the west. They now have been for the last couple of weeks around the Great Stone Dam. They have been staging in a number of location, larger numbers around the Bashara Boathouse. And then many nights uh, before they go into the roost, uh, they go out on the ice and we're trying to do some more research to find out whether they stay on the ice overnight or they do go into uh, trees. Uh, but that requires uh, uh, overnight observations, not there yet. My wife thinks I'm crazy, uh, but she's very supportive. A um, lot of community activities. That's probably a whole nother program. A wonderful art show the last couple of years at the Essex Art Center. Great coverage last year, Boston Globe, Eagle Tribune, uh, front page stories. And we've had Eagle Tribune stories before, cable TV coverage. We've done a lot of work with the Boys and Girls Club in Lawrence with uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth graders. We've also gotten a group of uh, high school students out last year from Groundwork Lawrence, fully engaged. I was with them the first night that these high school students got out and they're looking at me going, huh, this is gonna be so boring. And when they finished and they did a, a Zoom presentation, I had tears in my eyes. They were so alive with excitement about what they had learned about the Crows. They had a lot of Zoom calls with nationally recognized experts, but I think the thing that got the most uh, excited was they were out in the field, they saw these huge numbers and, and uh, they just wrapped their arms around. It was really beautiful. We've also done work with Mass Audubon Society. Of course, the Merrimack River Watershed Council, a big supporter, uh, Merrimack River uh, Bird Club, uh, at Andover Village Improvement Society known as Avis. And uh, we're gonna be bringing up groups from Brookline, you know, a bunch of other clubs. So thank you, thank you, thank you, John. I hope we were close on time. Uh, again, for those of you who have an interest, wintercrowroost.com is the blog. I update it as regularly as, uh, as I can. Uh, on Instagram, for those of you who have Instagram accounts, um, wintercrowroost.com. 
uh, is regularly updated. Uh, postings on MassBird, uh, eBird. Every night when I come in, I get something up on eBird. We have just launched a new Crow Patrol podcast. Uh, the second issue will be going up um, hopefully in the next couple of days. Uh, the third edition has already been recorded. We'll be going up in another week after that. Working well through a new children's uh, book about the crow roost that will be coming out of spring 2021. And for those of you who are photographers out there, um, on the blog you will find a uh, newly uh, published uh, four-page guide on how to take photos, particularly around uh, dusk and dark and, and all of that. Uh, so, John, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Wow, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Craig. Tons of information. And we've got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, can I just fire them off to you? And, uh, sure, go fire away. All yeah. Right. Okay, here we go, folks. Uh, we'll start from the top. Uh, I think this was, question was answered. How do you distinguish between cities and urban areas, uh, urban settings? I think... Uh, and we were talking about where they started out years ago. I think you mentioned they actually started out in rural areas. So, yeah, so the history on that, uh, as best I know it from the research reports that I have read, is that they would do this, this roosting activity would be in much more rural, heavily wooded areas, probably near rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds, and that kind of thing. And for those who had tracked those movements somewhere in the 70s, there was a notable change in these rural roosting locations to city and urban locations. And Kevin McGowan has talked about this and he touches a bit on it in his podcast, that there was an enormous transformation. And of course, it's hard to say, it, it may have to do with any one of a number of variables. Um, it could have been, you know, hunters and shooting, it could have been predators that we weren't necessarily aware of. But most of these roosts have now moved to urban centers uh, with significant ambient lighting. And it may be because of information exchange. It may be because there's some kind of a heat island effect. And uh, it also may provide them with uh, better avoidance with, uh, with predators. OK. OK, the, that uh, relates to a question I saw somebody posted about peregrine falcons, which are also um, showing up in Lawrence. Are they a threat to crows? Okay, so last night, uh, I think it was last night, I was out. So for those of you who don't know, there are nesting peregrine falcons uh, on the eighth floor of the Ayer Mill clock tower in Lawrence. If you were to position yourself on the west side of the building, look back at the tower, at the eighth floor level, there is a, a, an open window box. And uh, a box has been constructed, it's gravel line, there's a webcam in there. If you go to lawrenceperegrines.com, you can access the, uh, the webcam. And um, the peregrines lay eggs around the end of March, the eggs hatch about a month later, and about 40 days after that, the young peregrines, the fledglings make first flight. So the peregrine parents are around all winter long. They typically spend in colder days. They can be seen along the upper floors of the Verizon um, building on Hampshire Street on the north side of the river. There's some hot air vents. So last night I'm at the north end of the Route 28 bridge and I see this, this rocket ship blur go by me. It was one of the adult peregrine falcons and in its talon was one of the crows. So they, they, they do eat crow. And uh, as you can imagine with the numbers that we saw from the photos, there's a, a never ending supply. So they do, they do capture and they do eat the, the crows. And the peregrines really put on quite a show in uh, springtime, especially when the young are born and making their first flight. Great. It's interesting. Well, uh, here's another question. Um, how do the droppings affect the public, the crow droppings? <laughs> so in many cities, there are organized efforts to get the crows out of downtown. Um, they use light shows, laser lights, cannon blast, noisemaker, guns, you name it. The problem is this, in many cities, if the crows are right downtown, 
think of downtown, you know, North Andover, Andover, even Lawrence, if they're right in the immediate downtown tree-lined sidewalk areas, they when they come in, they they regurgitate these orange-colored pellets. Uh, they're, they're long and somewhat long oval shaped. And these pellets, when they're ejected, these are the indigestible parts of what they've eaten during the daytime. So when they get into these roosts uh, and, and they're in the trees, they will drop the pellets. They will also poop. They have a kind of a whitewash type poop and it stinks. So if your car, for example, is parked in an area under one of these overnight crow roosts, you get the stinky whitewash and the orange uh, uh, pellet splatters on your car because it's kind of soft and, and there is a little moisture there and you can get bombarded. When I was recently up in Troy, New York, the crows had picked a spot where the primary roost was in a little island in the Hudson River you know, that I could see and photograph very easily. Um, you, you could hit a three iron and hit a golf ball with it. It was a, hundred, a couple hundred yards from the edge of the, the, the river shore. But many of the crows also roosted in, in these trees that are over parking areas. And, and it is stinky and smelly. The pictures that you saw, I've walked under New Balance. And last year I walked a number of times under the roost by the 495 bridge. And, and part of why they also may move during the winter is it may get so stinky that even the crows can't put up with it. So it's, it's stinky, it's smelly, and there's no e easy answer. The last thought there, John, to share with everybody on the call is that, that um, the, the, there's not a lot you can do about it. It, it's, it's, it just, it goes with the territory. So, so what we're, we're blessed in Lawrence because they don't tend to find areas where there are people and sidewalks and businesses and parked cars. It's just been a real blessing here that they're not dropping these, these messy remnants in places that are causing trouble. And uh, because of that, it's, it's really not much of a bother in the Lawrence area. Okay. Great, we have a few more questions. Can we keep firing them at you? Go, go, go. Okay, all right. Um, let me see. Why do the crows uh, roost in some cases fairly far away from their foraging grounds? Um, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, the pattern is they come into these tight, dense overnight roosts for the reasons that we've talked about. And then they go out to regular foraging grounds during the daytime where they need to eat and they need to fill themselves up before coming back in. They don't tend to eat much or forage much around the overnight roost. They go out to foraging grounds during the daytime and the distances may vary because of the availability of, of um, supplies and, and, and resources. Uh, but they go out to forage and eat during the day and then they come back in and, and have this big slumber party uh, during the uh, during the nighttime. That that's the pattern. I can't tell you. Um, you know, some fly farther away than others, and it's just uh, it may have uh, to do with with resource and food availability. Okay, another question for you. Uh, are there other large roosts in New England? You've mentioned a couple, I think. So we're constantly uh, trying to um, put feelers out to identify other locations. Uh, I had some information a couple of weeks ago about a smaller roost out in Worcester, and I'm hoping to go out and visit that location in the next couple of weeks. Uh, there has been a, a roost mentioned up in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, there have been roosts that have been identified up in Lewiston, and Auburn, Maine, and Augusta, Maine as well. I would guess that the numbers might be a couple thousand. Uh, in West Hartford, Connecticut, there is a roost that has been as big as 20,000. This year, the count there was about 11,000. Uh, dazzling to watch and uh, really spectacular. And uh, then also in New England, out in Springfield, Connecticut, 
Uh, there's another roost located out there near Mercy Hospital, and there's a regular group that visits and, and counts and tracks that roost as well. So they're out there. They're not always necessarily noticed, and that's why we always ask people, just send us hints and ideas, and if we're pointing in the right direction, we, we can usually, you know, find the roost. But there are other roosts uh, in New England, yes. It's interesting. All those locations you mentioned have major rivers that flow through them. I wonder if there's a connection mm -hmm. between the rivers and and the roosts. Yeah. That's where the cities are. I don't know. Um, we had a person who uh, just was noting the stinky poop situation from 1998 to 2001. I was a resident at Lawrence General. The crows used to roost in the trees on the hill between the hospital and the health center. We walked back and forth on that hill every day. Boy, was it slippery and stinky. So there's an eyewitness account. Uh, yeah. let's, see. <laughs> let's see if we've got any other uh, there's a roost in the Framingham by Jordan's Furniture. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, we've had, that's interesting. We've had off and on reports uh, out in Framingham, but, but nothing that has been substantial or concrete enough. So sometimes we'll get reports. I've seen 50, 100, couple hundred crows, um, and that's great and that's helpful. Uh, but those, even those reports have been intermittent. So there used to be a very substantial roost in Framingham. It may still be out there, but if we don't have some kind of uh, a spotter or spotters, it gets very difficult to uh, be able to know where to, uh, to locate, uh, locate the bird. So the Framingham roost has been mentioned historically, but we've had no concrete updates recently. Okay, I have a, a question for you. If, if you're a novice like myself um, and, you, and you just want to see this phenomenon, maybe not even see the actual big roost, but see the crows coming in, do you have advice on uh, an easy access place or reliable place that people can go and, and see these crows starting to come in? Sure. So currently, um, we continue to see them gathering uh, around the Great Stone Dam, which is Route 28. It's known as the O'Leary Bridge, the Great Stone Dam, O'Leary Bridge, it's Route 28. St. Patrick's Parish is just south on Route 28. So uh, if you, uh, the Bashara Boathouse is west of the dam, and that's a very good place to pull in and park. Mm, 15, 30 minutes before sunset, you'll get quite a show right now of the crows. They tend to come down the river, uh, up river and down river. The river acts like kind of a highway for flight purposes, and you'll get very good views of them. Some of them will stage on the ice there in the trees back behind, and uh, they'll use that. You'll hear them, you'll see them. You can park your car, you can walk up to the edge of the river. It's a great spot to be able to view the, uh, the crows coming in you know, 30 minutes to uh, uh, before sunset to 15, 20 minutes after sunset. Then another great location that puts you closer to the overnight roost is Riverfront State Park. I was there the other day. There is a parking area. There's a boat ramp area, and that's that's been plowed somewhat. But just a little bit to the west of the boat ramp area, there is another parking lot area that tends to get frequently plowed. And if you just find a place to park there and you have on boots or snowshoes, you can trudge down to the edge of the river. And again, you'll see all kinds of action. Um, then uh, at the south end of the Route 28 bridge, there's a little strip uh, store area um, with uh, a couple of nail places, a, a, a hookah, vape, you know, whatever. You can park in there. Right next to that, on, on the north side of that busy parking lot is an empty parking lot. You could park there, walk across and get out onto the bridge. Anywhere on the west side of that bridge is, uh, is a pretty good place to be. If you go up to the north end of that bridge and off to the right, there's some places you can park up there and then you walk back out. If you're out on the bridge right now, you will, the action will be spectacular. And they have been roosting a bit at the north end of that bridge on the east side. But if you're out on that bridge on the west side uh, after sunset time, you're likely to see a pretty spectacular show still. Great, okay. So I have another question for you. Um, this is a tough one, I think. Um, has anyone correlated the droppings of crow roosts along the river with fecal bacteria exceedances or algae blooms forming downriver? 
Um, excellent question. There was um, Ann Clark, who is a biology professor at Bingham, Binghamton University in upstate New York. She works very cl closely uh, with Kevin McGowan, who's one of the most renowned, you know, crow experts. There's only a few in, in the country. And she had had a graduate student that had worked with her who was looking, researching nitrogen levels in those whitewash droppings uh, to see about the degree to which those nitrogen levels in the droppings might have uh, a number of different impacts on water supply. Uh, but there was nothing definitive that was learned from that. And as best I know, there is no ongoing research uh, to look into that. Um, for the most part, they're not, um, there would be m m minimal, uh, a, th that could become part of the Merrimack water supply um, through, through runoff, but you're not going to get a lot of that directly in the water uh, unless it's, you know, on the ice. Um, so uh, that, that's the best I can answer that question. Sounds good. I can answer a little bit from the Watershed Council's side on that. So we do water testing in the Merrimack, including downriver from the roosting areas. Um, but in the winter time, we're only testing once per month. It's, it's just, it's difficult to test in the winter because of the conditions. Uh, but it's an interesting issue. We had not thought of that, I can tell you. Um, maybe we should consider that when we test it. We, we ramp up our testing in the summertime. And of course, the, the crows are gone by then. So there would be no impact. Uh, any other questions anyone has? I, I don't see any, any more that have popped up. I think maybe if you've got one in, we can probably fit in one more. Just pop it in the uh, chat box. Uh, John, just as you're holding for a second, uh, again, thanks to all of you as we uh, prepare to wrap up tonight. Um, shoot an email at any time, any kind of a question, where to go, craig at wintercrowroost.com. Uh, it'll go directly to me and I uh, try to get back real quickly whenever I hear from somebody. So happy to help and standing by to do so. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, Craig. This has been really informative and a lot of fun. And um, we've had a great audience here, great questions. And uh, I'll bet there'll be a lot of people heading out to check out the crows now. So Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, thank you. And for those of you who might be interested in helping with counting, we're gonna put a team together and probably do a monthly count. So Craig at wintercrowroost.com, send me an email. We'll be doing some of that work with John and uh, other members of staff at uh, the council. So uh, thank you all very much and uh, check in when you can and uh, hope to see you out there and uh, uh, taking some time to be dazzled by the crows. Terrific. All right, good night, everyone.